From across North America, right to your podcast home, this is In Goal Radio, the podcast. Darren Millard, along with the co-founders of In Goal Magazine, David Hutchison and Kevin Woodley, we are very excited to bring you Elvis in the building today. Yes, I did say it, and I probably will come up with some kind of a little pun or play on words again. Elvis Merzlikens uh, from the Columbus Blue Jackets will stop by in a long, great conversation with Kevin Woodley. Is there any other type of conversation with Kevin Woodley other than a long, great conversation? Uh, we will also stop by the Hockey Shop, the Hockey Shop source for sports, Surrey, and uh, chat with Cam about uh, our continuing uh, discussions regarding chesties, and we will deal with the uh, the Brian's uh, model today as we bring in uh, the guys. And, uh, you know, uh, Woody, uh, this is our 94th episode, and Hutch, can you believe that you have been editing 93 of these along the way, and this must be getting easier as we go along? Well, until we started throwing some things like video into it, it was getting way easier. <laughs> I know I look back to some of those train wreck first episodes in terms of our audio, and uh, life has gotten a lot easier. Also noticed and sent this to Woody the other day, 347 videos that we put up for In Goal Premium members as well in this first 11 months. Coming up on the one-year anniversary of Premium in uh, in only one month, December 12th or so, I think is when we set, sent the notice out. So yeah, we've done a lot of work together in the last year, boys. Well done. Well, speaking of, I didn't know where you were going there, Darren, whether you were going to talk about great interviews or just long interviews. Let's be honest, most conversations with me are long, um, which makes for a lot of work for Hutch. But to tie it back into Ingle Premium and videos uploaded, nice job by Hutch to take our exclusive with Elvis Merzlikens and turn it into a sort of a simulcast for our Ingle Premium members. Uh, not only can you listen to it here, on Ingle Radio, the podcast, but you can check out the video. And I think in this case in particular, over at IngleMag.com, the video, it brings Elvis to life even more, right? It's like you're in his living room having this conversation with him because he's talking, you know, into the Zoom call with you. And there's an animation to his speech that will come through in the audio for sure. But even, even more so, in my opinion, on video, there's just an energy to this guy that I mean, fans in Columbus already love him for it. I think as a, any goaltender is going to love him for it. And so I'm looking forward to rolling out this, both this interview here on the podcast today, but also for our premium members. If you really want to sit down and spend an hour with Elvis Merzlikens, Hutch gave you the opportunity by mixing up that, uh, that video for us. And how about uh, Elvis? And you'll get this uh, from the interview in a little bit. He is a gear guy and he has a real plan. Like we love our man caves, our, our, gear caves so where are the backgrounds you see it all with pads and jerseys and masks and everything it's it's uh we're we're right into it and elvis is right along uh with that and that comes at the tail end of the interview what he's got uh, planned for his man cave uh both during his career and when he's done it uh, it kind of reminds me of the hockey shop uh, hockeyshop.com uh, uh source for sports surrey and and just what you see when you walk into to that uh, little bit of uh, goal utopia. Yeah, and I think, uh, you know, speaking of the hockey shop and speaking of pros, they've got a great sale on right now on Bauer Pro Stock Sticks. Vapor 1X, Supreme 1S, uh, from a laundry list of professional goaltenders. And not only do they have this, had this inventory come in, but they've released it as part of an early Black Friday sale. So you can go to thehockeyshop.com right now and get access to this inventory. You don't have to wait to Black Friday. And they're actually selling them. You have to use the code PROSTOCK, all one word, but they're actually selling them two for 300 bucks. And some of the names on there, uh, Frederick Anderson, uh, Michael DiPietro, and the big one to me, just because it ties back to Ingle Premium, Henrik Lundqvist. Of course, we had that article just a couple of weeks ago where Henrik took us into the stick room in Vancouver and sort of explained the unique grip that he uses on his Bauer Vapor sticks with the, the squared off inside edge and how he holds it in terms of the paddle and how it's rounded down at the bottom. Well, you can get pretty much that exact same stick. Actually, it is a pro stock stick at the hockey shop so source for sports right now and you get it two for 300 bucks you don't have to buy two lundquist sticks if you just want to try that unique grip that, th that we showed off uh you can buy one and then mix and match it with another but it's two for 300 using the the code pro stock right now at the hockey it's basically black friday offerings 
without having to wait to Black Friday, which means you don't have to wait for the lineups that inevitably come with Black Friday. And like I said, lots of literally dozens of different names. I saw some Stolar sticks in there. I mentioned Freddie Anderson sticks, Michael DiPietro. Uh, there were some Zane McIntyre models uh, in terms of the curve and stuff that I, I like the look and the feel of that handle. And as I said, of course, the Henrik Lundqvist stick that a lot of people would have had a chance to read about on on Ingle Premium in the past couple of weeks. So uh, whether it's the latest, the greatest, the newest, the best, or a chance to save some money on last year's model, make sure you check them out, the Hockey Shop Source for Sports, and online at thehockeyshop.com. Uh, maybe I'm naive, but I didn't realize that you could get a uh, Henrik Lundqvist uh, stick with that with that paddle, that grip. Uh, is that is that new, or, or has it always been like that? Well, you can't, you're pretty much limited to pro return. And this is something that they've managed to get their hands on before. Um, As you saw in that article there, and if you had a chance to look at it with, with not only Henrik Lundqvist sort of showing the benefit of that grip, but Sean Murray, a coach here in Vancouver, a local coach really encourages his goalies to use it as well. And he actually cuts in a, a trigger finger on the other side of it as well. And so for the hockey shop, it's always made sense with his students looking for that squared off edge and maybe not wanting to cut a stick. They've, they've sort of sought out some of these Lundquist models in the past. And uh, this time, another opportunity presented itself to actually get a Henrik Lund, you know, another batch of these Henrik Lundquist pro returns. It's not something, it's not an option where you go on their customizer and, and order the Lundquist notch that I'm aware of. Um, but it is something that uh, they managed to come up with. Like I said, not often, but every once in a while, they get a batch at the hockey shop. And speaking of which, actually, that's outstanding. You go on, they have Freddie Anderson Bauer pads as well, uh, pro return pads. He tried some. Looks like ultrasonic model, but again, you see the pro tweaks. He's got the uh, the old the old screws through the toe tie. Um, you know some things that are sort of only pro uh, old school sort of um, preferences that he has. They actually have a set of those pads on sale right now at thehockeyshop.com as well. Uh, there should be some pro return stuff uh, floating around after what we saw during the summer and the uh, the phase two and the phase three, where everybody was trying uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, Hotch, it, it, it kept us uh, like a head in a swivel where we were looking. I felt like a tennis judge uh, at times. Uh, you didn't know where to look uh, uh, because everybody had uh, different sets and different gloves and different combinations. How exciting is it going to be when January 1st or whenever the start date really is rolls around and we'll be able to see all the, the new equipment that these guys are wearing, not just the latest, greatest from, from all the uh, gear companies, but now new teams as well. I, I think that deal for sticks is unreal. I mean, if you need you need to pick up a twig for 150 bucks and then you get something that you can't normally order, that's amazing. I think if the yeah. hockey shop really wants to hit a home run, though, Darren, on, on Black Friday, they would release the uh, Kevin Woodley warm-up stick. Right, because that gets you through the wear and tear and saves your game stick uh, well, exactly. along the way. Exactly. I, so. I like it. Yeah, the Woody Has returns. Has there been any thought with Cam? That would never be on sale. That oh, item would too never valuable? be on sale. Well, they wouldn't be able to keep they wouldn't be able to keep them in stock if Woodley's name was on them. Let's face it. Uh, well, two sticks that'll get me through almost two years. Oh, uh, really? With 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 the people that I play with, and and I'm and as much as I try and get out as much as I can, that's two sticks. That's a great deal and gets you uh, a lot of ice time. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. As much as as excited as I am to roll out the Elvis Merzlikens interview in this this episode. I got to now, this this little stick conversation is giving me an opportunity for a perfect teaser for next week with Colin Delia of the Chicago Blackhawks because Deal's told us that uh, he, see, he hasn't gotten into the composite sticks. He still likes his foam core and they are getting tough to get. So somewhere in a warehouse, there are 200 Colin Delia models that they've set aside so that they can hope to get him through the next. I can't remember how many years he figured that would get him through of his career. But imagine quite literally having to set aside 200 sticks because they're going to be impossible to get. Kids these days, it used to be even us at Ingle, right? We talked about how this feels like a foam core. And the companies had gone to great lengths to sort of try and get that feel. As a matter of fact, this Bauer 1X stick, that was one of the features. And the 2X trying to get that sort of foam core feel in a composite. Well, now most kids don't even know what foam core feels like because they've never used it. So really, it's irrelevant except for guys like Colin Delia. And that was a fun part of the conversation we had with Colin the other day. And we'll have that for you next week uh, on episode 95 of the podcast. And, you know, much like Elvis, it's an hour plus and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Yeah, I used to be the foam core holdout. And then I tried uh, a composite and to much to your suggesting uh, the two of you and 
it's like a, a game changer. So I, I'm like, I, I'm surprised at, uh, at Colin look forward to that, uh, that conversation, but, uh, the gear segment this week, uh, brought to you by the hockey shop, the hockey shop source for sports, Surrey, the hockey shop.com is, uh, revolving around our continuing discussion, uh, with chesties and the Brian's model. Yeah. And, uh, a model actually, to be honest that we haven't had on, uh, for a little while, Darren, we, I think the last time we did an official review of a Brian's product touch was sub zero three. Um, mm-hmm. so we hadn't tried the optic and which meant we didn't try the optic, uh, two yet. And so it was interesting to sort of have it on in the shop and, and it was, it, it, you'll hear it in the conversation here. It quite literally is a model where, you know, it, it's, it's a little bit traditional in terms of its cut and its feel. And there was some stiffness when I first put it on off the rack and it kind of sort of lends itself to that conversation about not worrying too much about how something feels when you first put it on in the store, because by the time we finished this 10 minute conversation, none of that stiffness was there. Like it, it, it started to break in that quickly. And so at a time when companies, you know, some companies have gone out of their way to sort of add mechanical elements. Even we had the warrior last week, the Bauer ultrasonic, where they really changed the arms so that, you know, that mechanical feel means it, it's going to flex right away. No problem. Like it literally has hinges built into it. So it will do so. Sometimes the traditional feel nowadays, is, even though we think of it as quote unquote soft, it can take a little longer to feel that way. And you have to give it that chance. And I think from start to finish, even of this interview, it, it was amazing to me just how much more comfortable the arms of the, of the Bryant's Optic 2 chest protector felt. And the customizable, customizable fit, uh, if I can throw that out there, like it just, there's so many different elements, uh, Hutch, uh, when you listen to this conversation of how you can really make it uh, to your specifications. Yeah, I know, 100%. That's the thing that jumped out at me. And, and just as a reminder to folks, when you when you're listening to this, head over to Ingol and you can also watch the, the gear segment on there and you can get to know uh, Cam and, and Woody in person a little bit and see all that customization that's available. For me, the one, the one that was huge was just adjust, adjusting the neck height and well, yeah, and, and, and the sleeve lengths because I've got little T-Rex arms myself. <laughs> so, so no, the adjustability I think is, is incredible. And, uh, and the size, those two guys look massive in those things. And uh, I, Darren, you might even have some insight. Cam talked about an NHL player during the playoffs having a rather wide body because of that chesty. You might even know who that was. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't know firsthand, but let, 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 let me do some thinking about that. Okay. All right. And I'll see, I'll see after we listen to Cam (laughs) and Woody catch up, uh, I'll see whether that name, uh, jumps into, uh, into the front of my 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 mind and uh, the gray matter there but uh, let's uh, and there's another thing that as you listen to this and cam and i we're gonna have a conversation and uh, we'll pick up on that uh, after we visit goalie utopia and uh, head over to the hockey shop the hockey shop source for sports surrey the hockey shop.com our gear segment two men in chesties Welcome back to the Hockey Shop Source for Sports here in beautiful British Columbia, Surrey to be exact, the outskirts of Vancouver, suburbia, with Cam Matwiv, Goalie Utopia. I've already, uh, much to Cam's chagrin, made my way around the store, put my hand in all the gloves. Well, there's too many to do all, but as many as to make myself annoying. And uh, Speaking of annoying, we saw Cam come in wearing all three chest protectors because evidently he couldn't remember what we'd done already. You give this guy a week off and it just all goes to mud. We have finally gotten down to the new Brian's Optic 2 chest protector. That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to turn it over to Cam, start walking me through the features. Um, I guess just just overall where we start, profile, who it's for, what it's designed to be. Is this, is this designed to be a big blocking chest protector? Is this designed to be mobile? Are we in the best of both worlds here as it tries to do both? Where, what's, the, what's the feedback? A lot to cover right there in particular, but yeah, so second generation uh, of the Optic. Um, kind of taking over for what was a very slim down and small chest in the original Optic. Really, you know, that was at that time where everyone was trying to figure out what the NHL rules are, what they would involve, how big could they be what size should the shoulder floaters be slash the arm floaters things like that so this is now a second crack at it and what brian's tells me is that this is apparently still legal at an nhl level and is worn as you see here in um in the nhl in particular so 
Um, a great uh, knock for the unit right off the bat, um, you know, pro ratification immediately. So we're already on the right track here. Well, and we have seen some guys, uh, you know, some some big names with this chest protector hanging in the locker room in the National Hockey League. So uh, that checks out. Yes, yes, it does. So beyond them giving you your vote of approval, a um, couple of reasons why I really like this unit um, and what they've done to make it better for even from the last year's version is definitely the profile of the unit itself. One of the things I struggled with with the first optic was that it was very, very trim and slim. And, you know, yes, guys, you're going to be looking for that, trying to match up with the, uh, you know, NHL streamlined chest. But it was almost <laughs> too much. Not this guy, man. I want big. I want it to look big. And you can even see as you're, as you're sitting down that the shoulders have kind of puffed up and you're almost kind of rounded out a little bit more and a bit more of a box shape, especially up top. Um, and that's what they've really done to kind of uh, move the unit forward, I would say. Um, Let's be honest. I'm kind of rounded out naturally. Oh, hey, you said it, not me. <laughs> I was about to give you a compliment today. That that why said, why start now? Why start now? That said, so just for you, they've used their air knit material all the way throughout the chest to help make it lightweight. Okay, say that again slowly so I can hear it. Their what material? Air knit. Air knit material. Okay, that you see all over the front of the chest. So this brings down the weight of the overall chest as opposed to using just a straight nylon. Um, much more breathable too, as well. And you can see it sort of like a, it is like a, like a, like a knit material. It sort of covers all the blocking surfaces. Obviously we're still doing the podcast as well as the video segment. So for those that can't see us, uh, it really does just look like almost like a knit material that you'd expect to find on the inside lining of a chest protector. Correct. But they have something different on the inside. That's their hex air on the inside, which we will show on the inside with this chest here. So Brian's has actually moved over and brought something from their, um, uh, it's some of their older models of chess that they've kind of coined before. So Ecstatic makes its return, which is um, basically silver sewn into the fabric. In theory, bacteria can't grow on silver. Um, long story short, it does help to reduce the smell of the chest over an extended period of time. Um, so we have definitely something that you need. Uh, well, I have a Brian's chest, and my you know it still kind of smells a little we, bit. I'll be honest. We know why. <laughs> <laughs> okay speaking of stink i'll let you take over yes clearly uh one of my favorite features of the chest is the adjustable neckline in particular um the entire neck piece of the chest where the actual b-star logo is uh on ours in particular um you can velcro this entire area out come on and move it up or down so to give you that bit more of a custom fit and also for guys that are, are looking for a bit of that higher color protection in particular um, an ability to really kind of set it up the way you'd like. So again, for those of us who are listening to the podcast and haven't had a chance to check out the video, basically it's like, it's a chest plate with the hex air on, on the inside and it's got Velcro on the front piece of the chest plate and neck protector that it attaches to the back of the chest unit and you can move it up and down to adjust where it sits in your neckline. I got to ask, does this make um a neck guard almost a moot point like can you adjust this and get comfortable with it to the point where you don't maybe necessarily need an extra neck guard personally i i would still double up i mean uh, i'm on the vote of protecting especially your neckline because it is something you know you only get one shot at this one you probably wear a dangler too don't uh, you no <laughs> Darren Millard is going to lecture you later. Okay, keep going. That said, um, again, just to really find that custom fit, um, some guys really struggle with where it will sit with, um, you know, a chest protector in terms of the neckline and the mask integration in particular. And this really helps you dial it in right off the bat. Um, so, I, I, again, nice feature, um, something added, but not our only removable Velcro piece on the chest. Um, moving into the inside of the body, we have two. We'll call it rib pillows, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, thick pieces of foam that will puff out the chest a little bit more, especially in terms of a presence and help center it on you. Personally, as someone that tucks in their chest protector, I would take them out so I get a bit of a tighter fit around the body, which is would be what I'm looking for. But if you're looking to have it flare out a little bit more, um, a certain goalie um, in the NHL uh, Stanley Cup playoffs really had it evident that they would flare out their chest protector nice and wide. Um, we'll take a guess who that was. Um, this will give you that presence uh, and that same thing if you leave them in. Okay, so these are Velcro pillows that attach to the sides of the chest protector, sort of not so much around, I guess it could go all the way up to your ribs, but more around the side of the belly. Yeah, close along the ribs. Uh, yeah, it's where it, where it should uh, sit where it's uh, sitting properly on your, on your chest. <laughs> we'll bleep that one out. Um, <laughs> 
and extra layer of protection as well. Obviously, we talk about profile and presentation and how it fits big, but um, it would add a layer of protection having that extra foam in there as well. Yes, correct. And, and probably shot absorption as well. So, continuing on with the back style of the chest, um, Brian's has integrated their smart strap system just in terms of for adjustment for your body piece. So, no buckles here. All, the only buckle you have is on the alligator clip on the back, which good luck trying to break that. Um, this will allow you to, again, quickly adjust the chest protector, set it up to what you need. Um, back plate, large back plate with a hard block of foam right along your spine too as well. Again, another nice feature. Some things do happen, sticks, anything like that. It's nice to have a little hard piece there just to give you that extra uh, layer of protection, especially on your back in particular. Well, I mean, for me, my defense, when they get frustrated with the crappy goals I give up, that like they're likely to whack me over the back of the neck. That's a nice piece of protection. Just to make sure. Shoulder floaters, we get up uh, on the back side, adjustable through Velcro. We'll switch it to the front so we can take a bit of a better look here. A lot of things are Velcro on the chest, leaving us with, again, supreme adjustability. Um, there's that shoulder float over adjustment we were looking for. Back adjustment to raise the chest. This entire piece comes basically separated out. So you, again, you can really dial in the fit that you're looking for. Moving on to the arms. Same concept that uh, Brian's has been using actually for a number of years on their chest protectors. Again, with the Velcro arms, ease of adjustment, especially in store, but also for you when you get the unit home to really dial in the fit that you're looking for and the integration between your arms and your gloves. So in terms of arm length, you can actually change the length of this in terms of how it fits. Yes. In. Yeah. I think we measured it about almost two and a half to three inches of leeway room. Uh, up or down, basically, depending on where you need to be in the chest. And I'm assuming you, having been to a restaurant and seen the bill come up with those little alligator arms of you, you've got yours cranked all the way up, right? T-Rex arms. Figured that out. All right. The Brian's Optic 2 chest protector. What's been the feedback so far from your customers? We haven't had a chance ourselves to do testing on this, but what are you hearing back? Obviously, you're wearing the you're wearing a Brian's chest protector. What have you heard back about this one in particular? Yeah, it's a very good advancement and throughout their lineup. Good profile, good size, excellent protection. Um, you'll feel kind of immediately the arms are a little bit stiffer than some of the other things that we have on the wall. Yeah, but I, my, I can get a coffee here this morning, you but get, it's a little bit of you work. You get close, yeah. You know what? This is one of those things where it pays off in the long run. Um, this chest protector is going to last you a very long time. It's built with quality, hand-built in Canada by the guys over at Brian's there. We, we haven't talked about it with the other models, but that's kind of, it, it speaks to, sometimes we get in the store and it can be a little stiffer. I think the CCM Premier, I used to, people used to have that feedback. It's, you know, it's blocky, but uh, it broke in really quick. What's, yes. what's the, because I, I do think we need to start looking at almost like a sliding scale of break-in for different chest protectors. It's not like they're going to stay. If this one is a little stiff in the arms right now, it's not going to stay that way. What's the, is there a process you can share? Is there a way to get your chest protector broken in fast? What's the timeline on, on this unit? Not unlike what we're doing right now, sitting wearing it around the house, on the couch in particular. Uh, wearing it, playing video games, watching TV, you know, cook your dinner in it if you really want to. Uh, just all that movement will start to break in the chest in particular. So like cooking dinner, steamed vegetables, let that steam come and help. And... You heard it here, steam your chest protector. All right, okay, Cam. Um... Thanks for doing this. Thanks for walking us through the Optic 2 chest protector. Uh, took us a little while to get you in the right one. Had to shed a few layers, um, but I was just happy we got you through the door. Uh, nah. Thank you very much. M remember, folks, HockeyShopHockeyShop.com. Check them out. Uh, if you got any questions for, for Cam about fit, uh, about what size on this unit, ordering one online, they can take care of you. They want to get a hold and ask you directly in person, where can they get you? 604-589-8299. Do you know the international number, the 1-800 off by heart? 1-800-something-something-something-something. Check out it on our website at www.thehockeyshop.com. Not bad. A lot to play off of uh, there, but let's let's go back to the adjustable uh, components of this with the, the arms, but also uh, that ability to move your the the neck the collarbone area around like that to me just jumps out yeah and a matter of fact as uh we were just joking off air i we gotta have a little word with chris joswiak the the rep from brian's because i think that's something we if we'd known and been a little more cognizant of it earlier and done a review on this product it's something that we would have yelled from the rooftops because it's a really nice feature um not just in terms of you know the adjustability and and, and the layered protection um but just like 
just it, it's a novel concept and it makes a ton of sense. And as, as Hutch was saying, like uh, maybe the kind of thing where you could sell extras. I think you could have a few. I mean, I can think of all sorts of ways. That part of your chesty, especially if you're going to adjust it higher, is the first one that gets dirty and gross. Uh, you might want to replace it just for that reason to extend the life of the chesty. You might want to have a couple on hand for those tournament weekends if we ever get back there. Um, so you're not wearing something wet during the day. Um, gee, could you even go two different colors and have a home and away? Now that might be right up there with the warm up stick, Woody. Um, but but I think it's one of the the best features that they have, Darren. Yeah, the idea of uh, of being able to dry it out faster because that's where it, it gets wet with sweat and and the water bottle. Uh, there's there's a lot there. So uh, really fascinating stuff. Uh, the idea though that he doesn't wear a dangler, Cam. I'm I'm calling you out right now. You can't sell me all on all the safety stuff and then just throw it in my face uh, that I don't wear a dangler. And how about you, Woody? You jumping on the bandwagon. You don't wear a dangler yourself, and then you throw Cam under the bus. I'm all about deferral. I just <laughs> right off to the next guy. Pass that buck. You notice how I absolutely called him on it. Totally. Um, the fact that I've never worn one either. So. But I mean, I got to say, I, he, he said he still wears a neck guard and obviously more layers of protection, the better. Yeah. Um, but I could see with the custom adjustability of this. And, and the other part too, the way you can adjust the fit of this Brian's chest protector to really sort of tailor, if you want it to sort of really be big over your shoulders, you can set it up that way. If you want it to sort of sit flat and, and still presents really large, way bigger than the original optic. Like it just looks visually bigger. Um, the ability to adjust that because... You know, you've, I've, I've tried on chest protectors in the past where I really like everything about the fit, but that neckline is so low at times that you either you got to change all the straps to sort of pull it up and then maybe it pulls the shoulders up too, or you actually have to layer up and, and improve the quality of, of your neck protection because you're worried about how exposed you are there. Yeah. The, the idea of adjusting this, it's just, I mean, to be honest with you, it just seems like such a great idea and such a no brainer. And it's, it's actually been in past models. Um, from Brian. So Jaws, next time, tell us when you come up with amazing innovations and we'll shout it from the rooftops rather than having to wait to episode 94 of the podcast. Just remind you, Woody, on behalf of all the hockey dads out here, if you're not playing old fart hockey or if you're not in the NHL, you have to have that separate neck guard anyway because you have to have the certified neck guard to, to go on the ice. Um, so wouldn't it be cool if they could build in some BNQ uh, certification into that neck guard so that that would be a replacement as well and because you can adjust the level. What does B and Q mean? I have no idea. I just know it says that on the neck guard. <laughs> okay. Uh, something else that uh, that made me pause and and pay a little bit more uh, attention to to what you guys were were discussing was anytime Cam says, and believe it or not, this is legal. And it, it looks big, but this is legal and is worn in the National Hockey League. That gives you an idea that there's. There's a, a real space uh, dominance part of this that that it does grab your attention and and looks and presents bigger. Well, and perfect segue because I was just going to remind people, as Hutch said earlier, that um, all these things we're talking about. I think this is a chest protector that, as much as we try and paint the picture for you here on the podcast, you really want to see it for sure live. Uh, we will, as always, post it uh, on the post at ingolmag.com. We'll have the video, the new simulcast video that we're doing with Cam. Two guys in chesties, I think he called it a couple of weeks ago. Um, we'll also put that up on our Instagram channels for everyone to watch. And in this case, it's definitely a recommended watch to sort of just see how that chest piece comes in and out, see all the adjustability, see those sort of side flaps that you can add or take out in terms of the extra protection around the ribs and the adjustability, um, but also just see how big this presents. And, you know, that was a thing with the Optic One. It was a really good chest protector. And it was NHL legal, but they took the NHL legal version and sold it at retail. And it, it presented a lot smaller, again, because it was down to those specs. They hadn't sort of, they hadn't put themselves to the extreme of those specs. They hadn't pushed the limits of what the NHL would allow yet. And so it was a good unit, but Joe Blow buying it off the rack for whether it's beer league or even kids hockey, am I picking the one that makes me look smaller because it's NHL legal? Or am I picking the one that right. presents really big? This has a nice balance of the two of them. And hey, before anyone says, how come it's so much bigger in the NHL now after all these no root new rules and like starts like dialing up K Whitmore on us here? Anytime, like, yes, it presents a little bigger now. 
Uh, it's also a little more protective. There were some issues early. But anytime you have any criticism of chest protectors and size in the National Hockey League and you think that maybe you want to send a call out or shout out to Kay to, to, to cut it down, go watch some hockey in Europe. It yeah, yeah, like the KHL. Turtle shells. <laughs> Lacrosse. Yeah. Or Sweden or Finland. Like it literally looks like they're in tur- Some of these guys in their team pictures, the, the chest protector basically starts just below the earlobes and goes yeah. straight across like a square. Uh, and uh, I don't know who the goaltender is that Cam was referring to. I really don't. I was thinking about it, but uh, I don't. I don't think it's Robin Leonard, but it, it could be uh, because Ro- Robin already presents uh, as a big body. I mean, Mark Andre Fleury says the one thing he wants about Robin Leonard is his size. So I don't know whether that was the one that was uh, that was flaring up. But there, and there are some guys that are wearing that wear the the Brian's chesty that don't. Uh, because uh, they have equipment deals with other people. They 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 wear that, but it's not seen. So uh, I'm being truthfully honest here. I don't know. Uh, I will get to the bottom of that for next episode. Thank you very much. And uh, tell Cam to, to change those uh, those slacks up. He's he's got he's not doesn't have to wear the same uniform every week uh, that he's doing the uh, the gear segment uh, over at the hockey shop, the hockey shop dot com source for sports Surrey. So our uh, feature interview is Elvis, and uh, how about this? Elvis Merzlikens comes over, and we already knew he was a big personality, but boy, when he arrived on the scene, did he ever take over. Uh, Before we get and roll the interview, brought to you by Sense Arena, your takeaway from spending uh, almost an hour with Elvis Merzlikens. Uh, well, I think I, I think we all knew he was. He had this this personality that that drew people to him. This you know, big personality, but sometimes that gets there's a negative connotation to that. So I almost hesitated to use the phrase. He's just he's really easy to like. There's a lot of energy to him. Um, but what you get out of this interview, or what I got out of the time I got to spend with him, was the depth behind it, um, the 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 passion for the position that it's rooted in. Uh, the work that he's done to try and perfect his craft, the intensity that he brings to practice or <laughs> as you'll hear to his workouts. Yeah. Um, for as much as we think of the personality, there's a real pro there and he wants to be good. And, and, you know, as you'll hear was, you know, borderline tortured when he wasn't for the first half of the season, like he, he wore that hard and and there was a process for him to sort of get through that. And so, the openness, the honesty, um, the passion, it all comes through in this interview. And it was just a real pleasure to get to spend this much time with him. And uh, the hour flew, it was almost an hour and it just absolutely flew by because of all those elements I just talked about and the sincerity that he comes with. Uh, pushing the limits uh, right to the very end to every last second for this conversation with Elvis Merzlikens, but he does the same to himself when he trains as you'll get the, uh, the real sense of uh, how far he will uh, push his body when he's getting ready for a professional hockey season. It's the feature interview on In Goal Radio, the podcast presented by Sense Arena. Elvis, thanks for doing this. Um, I, I guess just to hop right in, where are you at? Can you can you sort of walk our audience through how you're preparing for a season? that we still don't even have a start date on but like what's this what's the preparation been like at what's what's your day-to-day your week-to-week in this i guess really a second off season of the same year um so yeah thanks to having me um uh so when i came back here to to switzerland i had my week of vacation which was the quarantine so uh, i didn't take any any off time really so uh, right away, right after the quarantine, I started to practice uh, in the gym with my strength coach. Um, that was going on like a month and a half, probably. Uh, and then just last week, I took another week off, which was like uh, I trained maybe twice in a week. And then I took really easy. But even then, I was just going there just stretch and, and and maybe do a little cardio with the bike but otherwise I was like more relaxing and and, and yeah I took I took my wife and I went to the the Lausanne to see to see my friends uh so uh yeah uh that that was that was my little vacation as well uh just this week I started going back on the ice uh I practiced already three times with Lugano 
tomorrow again I'm gonna have day off because we wanted to start really slowly, not go right away all in. Uh, even for the hips and groins, that I don't wanna I don't wanna just force them and and get maybe a little injury right away. So because like the team, they are going already on hundred percent. They are everybody here is already ready. They play the games. So for them, it's it's just normal middle of the season. For me, jumping in like this uh, with the with the hard drills, quick drills, it's a little bit maybe. I my guessing is a little bit too too so, uh, too early to do that. I think you have to to go step by step slowly and uh, and just get more practices uh, every week. Uh, this week I had three practices. Next week I'm gonna have four or five. Uh, next week I'm gonna start uh, working like uh, like uh, goalie practices as well. So my ice time is gonna be already longer. Uh, and, and yeah, and slowly, slowly I'm gonna go in that way. I, it sounds like even even as gradual as it is, it sure sounds like it's a lot. I don't know if easier is the right word, but a lot better than what you had to deal with during the last time you were sort of paused. Uh, I guess it wasn't an off season as much as it was a pause and you were stuck basically in Columbus in your apartment. This, this oh, sounds yeah. a little better. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is more, more, much, much, much better, of course. Uh, and even like, I feel more professional because I, of course, I have my sprint coach who is following all the time me. I have a lot of coaches who are following me. So uh, I, I feel even, even better like this. So, uh, well, when, when, when the lockdown was there, that was really, really harder. You didn't have anything to, to with what you could practice. Uh, even for workouts, it was really hard. So uh, right now, I, I feel happy and lucky. <laughs> What, what can you walk us through, like, especially for kids that, uh, I mean, back here, most of them are on the ice, but what kind of things do you do first as you ease back into it? Like when you're on the ice, what's the focus in terms of, you know, is it movement? Is it crease movement patterns? Are you taking shots? What, what gets you feeling good about your game when you first get back on the ice? I really hate to get back on the ice because usually the, the usually the, the the first two weeks you can't catch the puck because you had so much off uh right now oh gosh I, I don't know even how much how much time I was off like last time when I played was in Toronto so from Toronto till now that was a long time not catching the puck and the first two weeks I think it's I hate them I really hate them but I know that I have to go through them uh, because I get nervous. I hate when the players, they score and then they even celebrate. But you understand at the same time that it, the last time that you catch the puck, it was like a month ago, two months ago. You can't pretend to save every single puck and be on the same shape. So I feel kind of different this year. I feel that I really don't care about that the players score, which is really weird for me because I was really, really, you can ask any goalie coach who I had, I was really pissed off. My day was really bad because I had bad practice because they scored every single shot. But then they were saying, Elvis, this is just the first, second time that you are on the ice. I didn't want to understand that. I didn't want to accept that. So uh, now, uh, this week, I was like more easy. I was just trying to, I think I even didn't do any split save just to tell me that I wasn't like trying to stretch or something. I was just trying to, to get back used to it, to the hockey gear, like my hockey gear. I felt it's huge. It's everything is stiff. It's not comfortable. Sticks again, then you blame the sticks. You blame the, your, your blades. They are not sharp. And you have a lot, a lot of excuses. So. Uh, this this week I was just more trying to skate, uh, more on movements, trying to be on the right angles because even then, sometimes you drop down and he the, the scores, and then you look back of you and you understand you're completely out of your net, or out of your angle. So I was more trying to get back the feeling with the posts, uh, with, with my with with my crease, and then then slowly like today I was trying to more like really challenge the players like i was trying to get more serious but still again the reaction it's still there but 
you had to use to it uh, and even the read the game like the, the exercises maybe like two on one i understand that i'm back in europe here's bigger eyes the players has more time they make maybe one or two extra passes which you don't do over there so uh maybe, maybe that kind of get me mad as well because usually you get the pass in the NHL, you shoot right away. Here they get the pass, they look, oh no, I'm going to give it to back to back door and there is empty net and you are completely another angle. So I was trying to more focusing on skating and, and feeling the gear. And then like, like I said, uh, from next week, I'm going to practice like a, like a goalie practices. So then again, I'm going to try more easy, not to go really hard trying to more feel the post, uh, understand better where I am, where is my position, uh, and that that kind of stuff. Well, the good news is you've got a lot of time. Like, we've got still a month and a half at, at the minimum before you have to worry about a training camp. Would that be, like, with this, so I guess the equivalent would be if you're going back to the NHL in September, this would kind of be, oh, I don't know what, like, July for you? Like, the, would this be normally what you would be doing in July or August, or do you even have a sense of that? It's it's also out of whack right now. It, it it is it is it is a little bit weird, like uh, how the things are going right now. Uh, if looking last year in this time we were already playing a lot of games, so uh, you know, like it, 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 this COVID thing, uh, they change it a lot, a lot. How to say uh, traditions or, or feelings? I don't know. Like you feel different, you feel weird. Uh, especially I don't have any idea when we have a training camp. I didn't hear anything. So even that, like, it's hard to plan your summer preparation, even if it's not any more summer, but your preparation for the season, like, you don't know what, like, for me, it was hard to understand how much should I spend time in the gym, then maybe quit with the gym and go more on the ice and then like on the same time add little workout but again i don't i don't know and i don't understand when it's going to be the training camp so usually like usually i never went all the time in the gym before the training camp you have to be ready for the ice practices so more most important thing like for a goalie i never had like a lot of workouts during the season like your workout for goalie i feel that is just the summer you work out there you get ready and then you had to get ready that the, your battery is going to be long for all, all the season because during the season you're not going to have power energy to work out hard because you have so many games. You had to rest your body. If you don't going to rest your body, you're going to get injured because your muscles, they're going to say, stop, please. Like it's, it's hard to go all the time on the 100. So uh, it, 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 it's a little bit weird, but I think I'm uh, professional enough to understand what I need, what I have to do, and uh, and just have to think about that. Well, it sounds like too, like you've let go a little bit, like you know the shots in practice not getting mad, like you've learned to accept it, and rather than worry about it, just keep sort of following the path and trust it'll be there when you need it. Um, is it nice to have? Like, will you get a chance to work with Mike again in Lugano? Like, is it nice to have some fami some f familiarity at such a weird time when you get on the ice and do your goalie work? Is it with a guy that you know, and at least there's a history there for you too in terms of here's what we do to get ready. Uh, yeah. Um, I like I said, I didn't work I didn't work yet with the Mikey, uh, but we we had a little discussion this morning as well. Uh, he did really nice video of me. From 2017, uh, 18, I think. Um, so he, he showed me like how my position changed, uh, uh, how I got more with the premier fate, and and how I moved differently. And, and like there was in that video, you can really see like how wide I was and how more premier I got and how quicker I got and how more stable. On the shot line, I was, and uh, that was really interesting this morning to see that, uh, because obviously you never realize that when it, it's about yourself. So uh, it was really interesting thing um, about the goalie practices. I didn't had any chance yet because he left me 
just just alone just to get back into it um so yeah we're gonna start on monday and uh, and then we're gonna see how it's gonna be but i'm pretty pretty excited and happy to get back with mikey uh mikey did a lot to me he helped me a lot uh, and obviously where i got is just even thanks to him as well it's funny you mentioned the narrow stance like i like i don't know we've seen that trend around the nhl like as the game has gotten so fast laterally, I'm not sure you can play from a really wide stance anymore. It sure seems it would seems like it would be really difficult. I don't mean you specifically, but in general, I, I think it's tough to be a goalie in the National Hockey League right now if you're playing sort of locked in low and wide. It's more like uh, like a year ago, I would disagree with you because I was feeling so much comfortable to being wide. And then just, you know, a little push and then you stretch. But then uh, with my goalie coach in Columbus, Manny, he, he, like, he explained to me, well, to me, you have to explain like more than 100 times, but the, the, the hundred and first time when he explained it to me, I got it, that more primary you are, it's really about, well, first of all, we have much power on the push because you, the legs are closer and you have more, you are more stronger on that. And you save your energy because from wide jumping left and right splits and all that stuff, you get really tired. In NHL, the, the shots are so quick, uh, so fast and so many that you can't get so, like you can't waste your energy for that. You really have to, I'm not saying calculating, but you have to understand that, well, you today, you feel like this, you have to give so much this period, then you have to understand that there is a second and third and maybe overtime. So you have to understand where to really like give all energy into it. You can't come like in the end of the game or end of third period and there is overtime wasted and completely tired because there is overtime and you have to win the game. So I think the premier feet and even your body language more higher, it, it gets your even more energy because obviously you're higher with your back. You have more air that is coming in and out. So you're not closing yourself even with the hands like this. So you get bigger goalie. I was going to say too the other one, and I don't know if he would have ever, I don't know how much, how many, how much experience you had with him when you were with Columbus. But uh, obviously, we here in Vancouver a couple times now, Ian Clark's the guy who introduced me to goaltending in my 30s. And he always talks about tension being the enemy of goaltending. That sort of, like, like you said, when you're sort of all wound up and, and sort of spring-loaded, that's not necessarily a good thing. And locked in low and wide and tense probably would drain you of a lot of that energy. Yeah, I had uh, the chance to work with him in 2014. 15 or 16. Uh, that's the thing what he was saying to me as well, uh, that I was too, how to say, too strong. Like I, was, I wasn't, he wants more flu, like, like you are more relaxed in the net. So I, th I think that, that thing helped. Uh, I think they were on the same, uh, same uh, how to say, uh, mindset with the, with the, with the Manny. But that what he was saying, all the, uh, saying to me, like you, like I have just to let me go, like not to be so narrow all the time, strong with myself and trying to, to do something. Like the thing what he teached me was like, you don't have to catch the puck, but the puck has to hit you. Like you have to let it hit you, hit you. So this is again like you can be relaxed in the net. You're gonna feel more comfortable, and I think you're gonna make less mistakes uh on the ice on your like your goalie position that makes it makes a ton of sense um you talked about the hands i wanted to ask you've you've had a chance and 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 thanks to bob to for sort of help helping facilitate this interview have you had a chance to to try the sense arena and before you get on the ice a chance to work your hands like what's your what was your impressions first time i know you haven't had much of a chance to work with it you're just starting but such a different concept. Um, I'm just curious what you thought and whether you think it might help when you do get out there, you know, a little more regularly. Well, um, 
I just wish then uh, I would have the sense arena uh, in lockdown <laughs> because that what would be the thing what I would do every single day all day long. Uh, I love video games, so I think this thing it's uh, it's awesome. It it's really uh, realistic, uh, and even the, like the the arena it's really realistic. Like everything, it's really realistic. Even the shots, well, obviously that's a computer, that's a video game. Maybe they're a little bit too good, but um, still, it's it's good, good speed. Uh, it's not too easy. It's hard as well, but it's on the same time. It's not like you can't track the puck because it's a video game. You really can track the puck. Uh, I really, really like this thing. It's really awesome. Uh, I even gave it to my wife to try it, and I told her, so this is my life. And, and she really didn't like it, the box when it's coming on her, so she wasn't about that really happy, but I told her that that's my real life. That's what I see. So even she said, like, it was really good. It, 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 the guys did really good job, I think. It, it, it's huge. Obviously, it's still it's a video game. Like maybe for little kids, you can't leave them for 12 hours in the day with that thing in your head because you're not going to see anything anymore. But uh, yeah, again, I really like it. Maybe obviously it's just two sensors. Maybe there was like sometimes like shot maybe coming close to you, to your shoulder. Obviously you go like this. Yeah, body and in save. the game, in the game, they score because you see just the gloves. So you kind of have to save it, like with the gloves, with the sensors. So maybe it would be nice. Like I don't know, I have no idea how this thing works, but it would be really nice if you could have your pads and stick and your chest protector as well. So if it hits you, so you can at least work on everything. What you like, if the shots are coming here, you're never gonna catch it like this, like in baseball. You're gonna go more with the shoulder and let like rebound come to you. It's uh, well. I wanted to ask you: Have you used it with like with the videos of the actual like the computer shooters, but then the actual video where you have the real shooters, like like they? Yeah, yeah, I did that too. Yeah, found that pretty realistic. Uh, I understand they're working on a chest protector sensor, so you can put something on at least okay. and 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 make those you know that sh that quick sort of lean save. Uh, in with yeah. the shoulder and i think the next version you'll be able to see the stick as well so they're getting there it's remarkable to me how far it's come already and it sounds like there's plans to keep developing and i know there's you know at least one nhl team already that sees that like you said the tracking and the hands is something where hey maybe our goalies don't need to go on the ice every day they can get some rest and still sort of keep their eyes and their brain active in a in a goalie mindset no yeah of course even like the drills what they did they they are really realistic and they're good like uh, even the the players maybe first time from the angle he's passing in the back door then the second time he's shooting because i know I, i'm the first who is cheating a lot of times sometimes so i i understand even that and they they good they did a good job on that the, the computer doesn't let you to cheat like you really had to be on, on your position and uh, and perfect there Okay, so we talked about you talked about that last pause and being in Columbus. Um, and I was actually on the Zoom calls with the Blue Jackets when they did. And I remember hearing you talk about like ball shooting machines in your in your apartment and looking at things like that. How like how much better is this going to be when you do head back, having sort of some semblance of a regular off season? And I wondered if, in some ways, does it almost feel like because there was that big pause and then the playoffs? It almost feel like you're going back for a third season, like at least in terms of knowing what it's like at the start, how I get ready to start an NHL season. Is there any benefit? Can you find any benefit there as much as nobody wants to be in this situation? Can you find a positive out of that? I mean, you're asking me like how it feels like to start the season in NHL. Yeah. Like it, does it feel like you've already had two starts to a season? Well, um, Obviously, the first time I remember, my, even I talked to my strength coach, the first year when we when we work, uh, I think it's not that we work it harder, but we work it more. Like I told them, there is small ring. The, the, the game is going to be so quick. Uh, my body doesn't understand what's mean that, what is mean that 
and I need more cardio. So we were working like basically literally just in cardio. Uh, he's ex boxer. Uh, he's Swiss ex, ex Swiss champion on the boxing. So I think I was on the right spot and I knew what I had, what I, what he's going to do it with me. So the first year I worked more harder on the, on, on the cardio than on strength. And now that I, that I was there, I played a year. I understand how the league is. I understand not completely, but I still st- st- trying to learning, but still I have any idea before I didn't have any idea well, what, what's going to happen, how it is that league. So now I understand. And even with my body, I know where I have to give more or where I could maybe leave less. Like on the cardio, I felt great. I had uh, every, every game, I had good, uh, good energy, good power and everything. So this year I worked more, less on the cardio, but more on the strength. That's what I didn't do the, the year before. And on the same time, you mix. You go on the strength, but the cardio I make really hard, like a circuit. Like the circuits, I understand, like they can be hard, but it depends how hard you go. So the, my goal was going so hard that I puke because when I puke, I understand that's okay, that's my limit, which means you did a good job. You did your good workout. I'm not now saying like, kids, please go work out till you're not puking, but this is my mindset. Like I was trying to go so hard that it's really hard and you can, and you have to battle through that. Because sometimes there is overtime and you are five on three in box play. You have no energy anymore. You have no gas, but you have to fight through. Like you have to find a way to get through that. And, uh, and, uh, and this was like more my preparation right now. And obviously now I started on the ice, so I took more easier. One practice in the morning with the team on the ice and then in the afternoon, you just go work out. But even there, you don't do any more like, maybe eight exercises you just do three five and easy short ones uh, still with a lot weight what what you can take it but shorter quicker so my so in the end you didn't do anything but at the same time you did something for your body anyways and uh i think like the experience going in nhl leaving the the first year there you, you understand more the things you you understand more more how how the hockey works there because the hockey there it's really much different than here in europe uh it, it's different mindset different work uh the level of hardness is different uh so a lot of things are different there. well and it was always remarkable to me like we saw you know some of the guys that came over last year say give me like an igor shishterkin incredible goaltender had a lot of success overseas and and obviously it translated to the nhl but after a half a season in the american league to sort of adjust to all those things you talked about style being different it's no longer pass 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 dust it off and pass one more time like everything is direct to the net quick shots that's not like you can't just flick a switch on that it was remarkable to me that you came over and played in the nhl right away i know the season maybe didn't start the way you wanted in terms of results, but you still were playing well, it felt like, watching. What was the toughest part to that adjustment? And what sort of, you know, Corpy goes down at the end of December. What were you fighting more? Was it, you're such a confident guy. Was it confidence from it? Was it adjusting to the league? Was it all of those things, those first few months? And then what, what switched? Um, obviously it's a big, it's a big it was, question. Yeah, obviously it wasn't the start what I, what I dream about it. Uh, obviously, when my dream was you get your first game, you're going to make a shot out, your mom is going to cry, everybody's going to happen. In the end, in my life, happened that I went there, I got seven goals scored, and I was so ashamed of myself that I want to get back home. <laughs> so it was, it was hard to start the season like I started, but uh, that's what Manny was all the time telling me, like, patience. It's going to come. Patience. It's going to come. Well, yeah. All right. I got it. But 
till one point. <laughs> like I was nine losses and you're still coming to me and telling me patience, it's going to come. Trust me, after nine losses in your first year in the NHL, you are not any more patient. <laughs> you are getting crazy in your mind inside. So it was really hard my like mentally. It was huge, huge challenge uh, to myself. Um, it was tough moment for myself. I, uh, I agree on that. I'm not hiding anything. I didn't talk to my mom. I didn't talk to my brother. I didn't talk to my wife. I didn't talk to anybody. I, wa- I wanted to be alone. Uh, it, it was hard to get back, back on the truck. And then I remember uh, in Winnipeg, I tried too much to show maybe to my coach that hey I'm there I know to, how to do this so I I did wrong pass and wrong moment of the game and well I paid the price of that <laughs> obviously Torts wasn't really happy and uh, I wasn't happy as well but I mean I did mistake but I couldn't do the mistake in that moment in that in that right moment so uh I learned it from it. Uh, even even as 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 being there in NHL, it's not anymore like a a kid a kid league. Like there is a big boys. They are really serious. And uh, even even like uh, like coaches towards uh, he he teached me a lot. I mean, he got me. He made me better man, and which which is really nice. And I'm really thankful of that. But uh, on the same time. Like you, like, I think it's not about that. I came right away from Europe to the NHL and I was expecting that, yeah, I'm going to be ready right away. Uh, I agree. Maybe, yes, I should come to the AHL and play some games uh, to just get used to it, to the small ring. And I, I understand how players are playing here because they're shooting from everywhere, from the back of the net. They are shooting from everywhere. So I, I think, yeah, I should come here maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, 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 I'm not saying like playing a season because I was really against that. I, I, I yeah, even said to my, to my agent that to going, I had nothing to do, nothing against HL or the level of HL, but I'm just was like, my mindset was that in the, in the Canada and America, there is so many people, so many goalies and good goalies that they 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 play there they they fight there for for the spot to play in HL and NHL of course but from the Europe we are not that many so for me my mindset was like Elvis you're gonna go to NHL you're gonna be ready good good job congratulations but if you're not ready I'm not gonna waste my time in the HL I wanna I wanna play I I mean I don't wanna fight for the for seven, eight years to the spot in NHL. So this was my mindset. And that's why I didn't come a season earlier to play in NHL. I should come maybe the when I when as, as soon as I end up my season in uh, in Switzerland, I should maybe come for the playoffs to the Cleveland. I agree on that. Yes, I should do that. I didn't do that. Well, yeah, I feel bad about that. But still, I think that to be before in HL, like playing just playoffs, I think that would be helping me more than I just came from Europe right away and started to play in NHL because that was huge, huge step in the, in the forward. So yeah, like, like I always say, like you can't jump too high because sooner or later you're going to fall down. You just have to go step by step, day by day. And, and that what happened. Like it took me a little bit of a while, but then again, uh, when when Corby got injured, I, I felt that, well, this is my last chance. But it's not like somebody told me that. I told to myself, this is your last chance. Or you take it, or you're getting back to Europe. So I had I didn't didn't put any pressure on myself. I really deleted again everything what I had around, and I just focused it on the game. I even didn't play it anymore like I played the game the nine games or ten games how many I lost before because before I was thinking oh no I have to go down now no I had to go to reverse I was thinking what to do during the game then 
it's a bad word. I'm sorry, but I said to everybody, I'm just going to play. I just want to play and I just want to get fun and have fun. And we're going to see in the end what's going to be the result. But then again, the great things come up. First shout out, second shout out, third shout out. And I understood like, this is a lot. Like, I didn't expect that for first year. This is too much. But on the same time, I was like, no, I lost 10 games. It took me so long to get to here that those shut out and after the, another shut out, I really didn't care about that. Because it was like, I really, I was happy, but, but I was more happy for the team that, that we were winning and that we were going higher and higher. But on my personal, my mom was really proud. My, my, uh, my brother was really proud. Everybody was really proud. But I really didn't care about that because I, I said like, no, I, I lost too much compared to what I'm winning. So it, was, it never was enough for me. So I want to push it harder and harder. And, and yeah, and I'm going to keep pushing harder because I'm not mad of myself, but I, I'm glad that my start in the NHL was like this because I could learn. And that's a great example, maybe even for a little kid, that you don't have to give up because there is bad days and there are going to be bad days. And even in my future, I'm pretty sure there is going to be a game where I'm going to get eight, nine goals. But this is our goalie life. Today, you are a hero. Tomorrow, you're going to be the problem. But at the same time, you have to be ready how to handle that. When you are a hero, you can't be too fancy. But when you are, when you are the problem, you can't get, let you get you down, so like really down. So you have to stabilize that and you have to be kind of in the middle, I think. And that's a lesson that's hard to learn. I was actually going to ask you if you worked with, like, I mean, we know guys that work their whole careers with mental coaches to try and get to understand that. It's really easy to say one shot at a time. You can't, you know, you can't focus on results one puck at a time. It's really hard to do. It's really, a lot of the things that we preach are really hard to live. It sounds like you found a lot of that balance through just through yourself and through experience. Did you work with anyone through it or just, just you figuring it out? No, um, I, I work with my mental coach. Uh, I started working with him in 2014. Um, so yeah, in the start, it was more, obviously it was more business because he was my mental coach and I was his, uh, client st uh, student. Uh, so, well, obviously in, in all these years, uh, we just became friends and uh, there was no more like, like more business, but there was more, uh, more, more advices, like from the friend, uh, he really teached me a lot uh he prepared me for 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 that for the nhl uh that that was our goal uh, and he prepared me I mean mentally to get there uh we understood that it's going to be really hard it's not going to be easy um like obviously if it would be easy everybody will do that so it, 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 he was making me more ready every year to go there and he was making me even challenges uh, against me to like to 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 see how i can handle uh i think like even the playoffs here in lugano like mentally i just got to finals mentally uh because physically i was exhausted and and, and he helped me again really a lot we were down three, three, one, I think, in the finals, and we lost game seven. We, but still, we got back to the game seven. Uh, so he did a really good job. Um, he's still doing a great job. Uh, we're, well, now I feel that, that it's, it's interesting that I can maybe teach some little other kid because uh, I know how to do it. Uh, well, like, like the first time when I met him, he put a candle and he said, watch the candle. Now, when I was 14, 15 years old, I was like, well, what, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not stupid. Why I have to watch a candle? But now when you watch the candle, you as the human, you really don't realize that there is just one color, white. 
because you, if you're gonna watch just the candle, you're gonna see red and yellow. But if you're gonna keep really watching the candle, you're gonna see just white color. The candle, it's white. And, and but then you're gonna even, he's teaching, he kind of teaches me the everything, the focus, uh, even how when it's something if you get hurt how to not hiding but how to it's all mentally i mean if your shoulder hurts during the game you can't just quit you have to do about something you have to forget about the hurt and you have to think about the game uh, and and, uh, and this is our little little small things what he teaches me uh that brought me far i think uh, and there was a lot of times that helping me all things what he teaching me i wanted to ask you quickly i forgot to ask like uh it must have been tough to you do all that work to get back into the bubble and you end up with the groin injury how long did it take you to get sort of past that was it one that took a few weeks and how hard was it to watch well obviously i i, I wanted to play right away um like like the finals, uh, I love it to take the pills against the against the pain and just play, and show that I'm the man. But obviously, that's what the doctors said. You you have long career in front of you. Uh, you have to be really serious about your body. You have really to take care of your body. Like even if I have off, I I stretch every day because I just love to stretch, uh, and I feel great. That that's my morning. Like. I can not drinking the coffee, just stretch and you're going to feel right. I mean, that, that's how, how I wake up. So you have to really take care of your body and, uh, and be serious about it. I mean, I understand it's playoffs, but at the same time, it wasn't the finals. Would be the finals. I, I, I would play. I mean, I, it, even there, it's different. In Europe, you say, you, I want to play, you're going to play. But in the in NHL, there is doctors. They are deciding, are you playing or you are not? So they decided I'm not playing. I wasn't playing. And I was uh, doing all the all massages, almost the therapies uh, with them. So, uh, yeah, but it was painful, to, obviously, to sit there and just watch because you want to be there and you wanted to play. Um, but, yeah, on the same time, it was obviously beautiful to see how Corpi was fighting the thousand overtimes <laughs> <laughs> i would have been tired just watching that frankly um actually i remember my first playoff game as a reporter was here in vancouver and it was four overtimes with roberto luongo and the dallas stars and i think it was his first playoff game too i think i wrote that he got to get two playoff games in one it was exhausting <laughs> um what uh, you mentioned stretching like uh, like how much do you stretch in the morning like are, is it like yoga or is it like more goalie stuff like are you like an hour are you like Kipper used to, I don't know if anybody's ever told you, Mika Kipper saw on a game day, 45 minutes before morning skate, 45 minutes after, 45 minutes before the game, 45 minutes after. It was three hours a day on a game day of stretching. You're not quite into Kipper territory, are we? Well, not maybe 45 minutes. <laughs> I, would, I would do maybe like 25 or half hour, but it's more like really like how, how long your muscle going to, like I, I, I go more on the feeling. Like how tight is your muscle? Uh, maybe the left leg, it's, it's so loose that you just do it 10 seconds, but the other leg, you're going to do it two minutes because it's tight. Uh, Feel that. But still, yeah. Um, every morning, again, even after, like this is, this is where you, even during the practice, even when the coach is talking, you, you keep stretching because I hate when the muscles get cold. And then there is like, three or no exercise started and you are like jumping left and right and then you're gonna pull up your groin so that's why how it's gonna happen so you i love even during the game like even if if we are in power play which means two minutes you're gonna be in the in the end of their zone so you still have to do something stretch a little bit crack your back or do something like i, I hate to just stay and watch and then when it's coming then they are coming and then you when you, when you go fast or explosive then that's when you're going to get injured i think hey i've taken up so much of your time here but let's have some fun gear you're a, you're a guy with style from from cars being an audi guy lots of style love it um bauer comes along and you can do anything with your pad 
Like, how cool was that for you the first time? I remember the sets for the World Championships, some of the Lugano sets with the gates, Columbus. Like, you ha- did you take the, that Columbus skyline? Are they there and you kept them in Lugano or like took them home with you? What, like, like, does style matter? And how cool is it that you can do anything on your pads now? Oh, this is really cool uh, because I, I, I remember Brian's was doing. In, Brian's were only one who were doing in back then. Then Vaughn was doing the same. You could put your logo on the pads, but nothing much more. Uh, so I was really, really happy when Bauer did that uh, because I'm working with the Bauer like uh, a while. And I have this great guy, Max. Um, we are working really good. Uh, I know him like maybe five years almost. Now nah, five, maybe now four, three. So um, it's nice even how professional are they there in the office. Like you tell just your ideas and they give you just 10 examples. And from those 10 examples, you cut for maybe five. From those five, you're going to cut another two. And then from all those two, you're going to just build one pad, which is going to be really beautiful and, and, and sick how you like it. Uh, my first pads, what I got uh, in Columbus with the, with the Columbus City, I asked them to keep it if I can. Uh, I brought them back here in Switzerland uh, because when I'm going to settle down with my house, I want to make a room just with the, my helmets and put there my first NHL pads. Uh, plus, I, personally, I really like them. <laughs> Um, so even now we work it already for the next one. Uh, not going to tell you what I'm going to do it there. No uh, pressure. I figured ready. these were a big secret. <laughs> They're ready. Uh, just have to order them and, uh, and that's, that's it. But otherwise I'm really happy that even, even kids, if, if, if they, if they can make some cool pads, cool designs, it's, it's always nice to to see a little little kid with a with a with a great uh, with a crazy pet. Did you was there a guy that you used to growing up like as a young goalie when you first became a goalie was there a pro or was there a like you talked about the other pads Brian's and stuff were were you a gear guy were you watching what guys wore and like I said did the style matter did cool graphics matter was that part of what attracted you to the position at all? Uh, I just remember well about the gear I really didn't care about it. Okay. Uh, but I remember I was broken the sticks really, really quick because I said that, I mean, professionals, they're breaking the sticks. Why I can't break the sticks. So I was all the time breaking the sticks against the, the post and then saying, mom, like, look, I broke the stick today. And I was feeling cool. But my mom, she was really mad at me because she was spending the money in those sticks, not me. So I didn't understand that. But after three sticks that I broke it, she didn't buy me any stick anymore. And she left me in the net with the player stick for a week. And then I understood that I can't break just the sticks like quick. I love it. Oh, so yeah. So ba- somebody set a bad example there at the pro level for you. Um, <laughs> who was, did you have a guy growing up? Like, w- w- like when you, when did you first become a goalie? was there a guy that like, Hey, I want to be like him. Did you, a, a guy early on, even if it was a pro over there where it was like you, wanted you tried to play like him or anything like that do you remember who that first guy was um when i when i was little little my idol was uh like the dream like i want to become like him was arthur serba the last oh. goalie so but then when i was growing more up uh when i starting to understand what's what is nhl what is that league and what is it so then my idols was Bruder, um, Kaprasov, uh, uh, yeah, they were my top two goalies. What I was like, even when I was playing outside with my friends on the street, I was like more thinking that I'm Bruder. <laughs> uh, but then again, when I was growing more up. When I said I want to become like him, it was Flurry. Um, I was crazy on Flurry. Uh, he was my idol, and and obviously Price. Uh, the, those two guys, they were my my idols. That I was like, I had 
I think a lot posts in my in my in my in my bedroom just of flurry. I had jersey of flurry. I was like really dreaming to became like him. And then and then yeah, my mom just rem- <laughs> she just reminded me after the game that she just sent me the picture of my of my room when I was a kid. And uh, uh, when I had everything like blue, baby blue, because you know, Flory had those ba- uh, not not pads, but the jerseys like of the Pittsburgh baby blue, and I had yellow pads as well when I was a kid. I painted them with the spray. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it was it was more like Flory and Price, and, and then Luongo. I really like it, Luongo as well. Uh, then. His brother was my coach in Lugano. So I had the chance even to meet uh, Matt Roberto. So it was really nice as well there. But then obviously you get, uh, when you get for 14, 15 uh, and you have Roberto Longo in your practice size session, you you are in your mindset, I'm going to show you who's better now. And then obviously <laughs> you, you try to challenge him. But then you understand that uh, he's much better than you and you have a lot to work so to get there i forgot about leo being over there i I totally forgot about that just last one then real quick like some of the influences you've had like and this is probably a big one because i know how like you had leo early and i remember roberto going over there for some, late in the summer at one point yeah. um i remember talking about that with him um as you if i as i turn my mine around there's my computer screen so you can see we got the the olympic jersey but then but then yeah. You probably you recognize that pad. His uh, it's his Reebok P4 from uh, from one of the years with the Canucks there. So I'm a big fan as well. Uh, Leo, uh, we, we talked about Mike Lawrence uh, a little bit, Ian Clark, but also Manny. Like, how important are those different relationships, and and what have you taken away from some of those guys over the years? And Manny, like I Manny, see. seems like it's as much about the relationship as much as there's teaching as well. But that relationship seems so important to you guys. Yeah, um, every single goalie coach who I had uh, brought me till somewhere. Uh, my first one, Dujan Sidor, I had uh, when I was a kid. Uh, he brought me to the national team, and he brought me to the professional level in Lugano. Uh, without his help and his agreement to stay in Switzerland, I don't think that I would be the guy who I am today. Uh, from there on, well, that's the business. They fired him, and uh, and then the thing switched it up. Then there come Leo, and and Leo again. He was he was like my brother to me. Um, he he was the first person who understood like when push me hard, and when he was seeing that I was uh, I was maybe a little bit too tired. He was like leaving me alone or giving me even off day. Or something like that. Uh, I had great relationship with him. He helped me a lot. Uh, we did a lot of nice things. But then again, um, he had another different uh, opportunity to be back in in the states, so he left. And then uh, came in the Mikey, and with Mikey, uh, with Mikey. Oh well, with Leo, I had even Mick Anderson, uh, the Swedish goalie coach. Uh, he he teached me more like how to use the legs. Obviously, uh, I felt really that he teached me that he really believed in me. I remember that he said, "In three months, you're gonna play in this league." And I was just junior, and I was laughing. I was like, "There is no chance that I'm gonna play here." And then in three months, uh, three months after, he asked me, do you remember what I told you? And then I was playing. So again, I really had a good friendship with him as well. Well, Mikey, uh, I think Mikey is the guy who who brought me to NHL and he just left me in great hands again, uh, which, which is Manny. So uh, Mikey did a huge, huge job with me. Um, he, again, same same thing there was really there is a really good friendship but at the same time when it's about the business there is a business and uh, he just wants to help you uh, i remember we had every every week we had a day when we were meeting in the coffee shop and we were just talking about the week uh, maybe we had three games we were talking about all those uh, all those three games if we didn't have any games we were just talking about the life uh, we had our tradition to go to coffee shop every 
one day in a week. Um, so he had his own book where he was writing down everything, uh, what I was saying. So uh, it was funny. Um, but yeah, he did really, really good job to bring me to the NHL. I think it's it, it his credit. Uh, but then again, Manny, uh, I have such a good friendship with him. My wife has a, gr a great friendship with his wife. Uh, so it's again, it, it's awesome to, to know a guy like him. You can have fun with him. But at the same time, when we are talking about the business, it's about business. Uh, he's always going to, even, even like when we are golfing, when he's teaching me how to golf, he's maybe saying, Elvis, put your back how, in, how you're doing it the net. And then we are talking just about the hacking, and about the position, and about all that stuff. Uh, but yeah, he's way too good in the, in the golf, and I'm terrible, and I have a lot to learn. Um, I'll leave it at that. I did Elvis named after Elvis. You speak four languages. Do you play an instrument? No. Okay. Do I want it. I want it. I want to, I wanted to learn, uh, how to play guitar, but I understand that it's really tough. It's hard. Uh, but still, uh, there's nothing impossible. So Sooner, uh, sooner uh, or later, I gonna I gonna buy a guitar and I'm just gonna start playing something. Well, I mean, it would fit with the name, of course. Uh, we know you, you were named after Elvis because your dad was a massive fan. But if you keep digging around at ingolmag.com, I tell you what. Now that you got the subscription, just search in the corner "guitars and goalies," and believe it or not, that glove hand that you talk about when you first get on the ice after three months off. Playing the guitar can actually, it's been scientifically shown, it can actually help your glove hand. So that's, that's the last really? little one. I'll, I will leave that one with you to explore that story. I had to ask if you played an instrument. Um, Elvis, thanks so much for the time. As so much of your time. I'm looking at the clock here and uh, yeah, I owe you one. I owe you a few on this one. I really appreciate it. Our audience is going to love oh, this. Thank There's you. a lot thank of little you. kids that'll take this advice. And uh, thanks so much for this. Really appreciate it. And all the best. Look forward to seeing you hopefully at an arena someday in the near future again. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you. So there's the little bit about the gear, which I want to get into, about uh, his, his man cave uh, when he eventually retires and he saved his first set of pads. But the, the idea of uh, Sensorina VR I, I never thought of it. Like he, he let his wife try it out and uh, it wasn't for her having people shoot pucks uh, at her, but it, it occurred to me. Now everybody can experience what it's like uh, to have pucks shot at them through Sensorina VR. I don't think that's the intended use of this technology, but boy, what a, what a side benefit. Uh, Hutch, can you imagine that? Will you put it on, on your daughter or, or, or your wife or, well, I know Maddie already plays school, but. Well, wow. we, we did similar, actually. Maddie had a teammate over here um, the other day and COVID stuff going on, but they're in a cohort, so uh, felt that was okay. And uh, teammate's a defenseman, and he put it on to try it. And there was a little piece of me as I handed it to him that thought, uh, what if this goes too well? Like, what if he walks away from this experience saying, oh, that's easy? And, yeah. uh, of course, he kept saying it was easy, but we kept hearing the pucks going off the bar and into the net, so... <laughs> uh, I think at best he got one out of nine shots each time he did sort of a nine shot circuit. And uh, so I felt relieved maybe that uh, it's not easy for a defenseman to step in, even though all you're doing is making saves with your hands in the case of the drill that he was doing and not that full goaltending experience. So yeah, it's so awesome that, uh, that with the Sense Arena VR, you can just step in there and get a real feel for what it's like. And the new release that uh, we've got access to now through their beta program uh, actually allows you to then turn around and see what you were doing in the net as well. So you can analyze um, the play from another perspective, not, you know, afterwards as you go back. So, um, you know, that ability to to look at stats, to look at how well you track the puck, what your reaction time was, um, not just basic drills like, uh, excuse me, basic stats like save percentage and so on, I think takes it to a different level. And now the ability to turn around and see how you were reacting to those things um, just an incredible tool. And then 
we haven't really talked about it much and 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 Elvis didn't in in his interview there but um these other uh cognitive drills that you're able to to work on outside of the ice although they have sort of a context um within hockey to them to develop those sort of hand eye and reaction skills um it's just a whole nother level that's built into the into the system as well so an incredible tool and the ability to take it into the rink for a warm up we did that as well um i think it's it's going to be a game changer and we're we're in a tough time right now guys where where we are getting shut down left right and center um from rinks now again unfortunately as this second wave happens and i think it's going to be an even more important tool so that we can retain that contact to the ice and uh, and to our training when we're when we're at home Nice little bit of synergy there too for the Sense Arena product and uh, Elvis working with it and being able to sort of walk us through his experiences. And thanks to Bob Tativa from Sense Arena for sort of sending that email to Elvis to sort of feel out whether he'd be interested in talking to us and sort of helping facilitate this interview with him. Um, I got to say though, as, as funny as it was to hear him talking about his wife be in it and this is my life, this is, my, this is what I do. Um, there was a part of me that was like, that's great. Except like, I can now picture my entire beer league team asking for a turn and just basically <laughs> telling me how easy this is and how much I suck even more so than before for the rest of my life. Oh, okay. But, but I got the trick for you, Woody, because you can actually dial in the level that you play when you're working with it. So all you have to do is you do a couple of reps at sort of the 10 year old level. And then we, we can sort of tweak it over to pro and then hand it to your teammates and then they'll think you're actually good. Does it go to 11? Yes. <laughs> Dial it up to 11. Um, yeah, no, I think that sounds good to me. Although I think the one thing that we'll be missing from a beer league perspective is the warm up shots off the mask. So I'll probably just stand behind them with a stick and whack them upside the head every once in a while. You could actually, you could literally have head save drills built into this where you're not going to get hurt. Do you remember probably, what was it, three, four years ago, we went up to Net360 in Kelowna and just for fun, they started one of the sessions bringing out those soft orange rubber pucks and doing headshots um, just to, you know, have, a, ha- have some fun while, while they were, you know, getting through a tough week of training in Kelowna. You could actually do that with right now and we could try the old, can I control the rebound with my forehead thing. From the do not try that at home file, uh, I, I headshots. Do uh, we do lots of that. <laughs> As a warm up. Uh, the man cave is cool. He saved those, uh, those pads from his, uh, from his first NHL season. Uh, and not giving away what he's got planned for the 2021 campaign. Uh, we also uh, talk about uh, what was weighing on him, and then he finally just decided to have fun. I thought that was a great message, too, when he just shed it all, the the technical, the tactical, the the preparation, and just said, I'm just going to have fun. He used different language, but uh, I, I thought that was uh, that was unique. And when he started on his role, he felt like he had so much making up to do that he didn't feel – bad about uh, the shutouts piling up and all that kind of not that you would feel bad but that that uh, that you weren't getting greedy he was greedy because he wanted to try and make up for that that start I thought that was interesting uh, insight into his mental aspect well and just even his mindset going into that before before the bubble burst and everything started to roll you know he started to get 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 the wins that that it eluded him for the first couple of months of the season like like really honestly going in there saying Jesus like like I'm, if I if I if it doesn't start now, if I don't start now, I'm I'm going home. Like right. the, the amount of pr- the amount of pressure it would seem he added to himself, and yet at the same time was able to let go of it and just go out and play and have fun. You know, in the next breath was, like I said, a, a breath of fresh air just to sort of hear him share the honesty of those emotions and what he went through in the last season and and how he's going to come out better for it. So two and a half months into his first NHL season, he's already thinking he's on the bubble of going home. Like that's that was like intense and from there he goes on a 950 run for the next three months and honest right like how often do we listen to guys um you know away from this podcast in regular media where they're very guarded about everything they say and give the correct answers and here knowing he's in a community of goaltenders elvis really opened up and and gave us the raw emotion i thought that was so good for any goaltender to listen to because we put these guys on a pedestal and now you, you can look at him and see, now he's experiencing the very same thing. I mean, no, nobody in Adam hockey thinks I'm going to get cut from this team if I, if I don't make a few saves here, but, but kids do experience those sorts of emotions. They put those sorts right. of pressures on themselves all the time. And so, to, so to, to hear that 
A, somebody at that level is going through the same thing that we are and that uh, he was able to persevere and get through it. And, and I might add um, how good on Manny to, to be that supportive person to help him through that time. I mean, some organizations might have just after the first four games, he might have been done, as he said. So that's kudos to Columbus and kudos to his goaltending coach, Manny Legacy, for, for helping him through that time as well. And Mikey is Mikey Michael Lawrence. Lawrence. Michael Lawrence, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Michael, yeah Michael Lawrence, who's, who Elvis is. Like, we caught him. They had a meeting that morning to go over video and sort of his progression and sort of plan how they were going to work through these next six weeks on the ice because Elvis is skating with him in Lugano now. We caught him basically just the week as he's getting back onto the ice for the first time here in November. Uh, the first time since he left, well, he didn't leave the bubble, but since he was forced out of action by a groin injury, I think August 7th, um, you know, against the Toronto Maple Leafs uh, in an overtime game where, where he played through the overtime hurt. Um, so, you know, he's that relationship is, is obviously important to him. There's a trust. It's good for him to be able to, unlike the last pause where he was stuck um, in Columbus in his apartment, basically, he's able to get on the ice and train with a goalie coach that he has, you know, some be- some background and belief in. Uh, it was it was just kind of cool to sort of have him, like you said, Hutch, be so open and honest and walk us through what he's going through. Is uh, such a crazy time too, right? Like he's 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 it's almost like he's starting a. It'll be like this third start to an NHL season, and he's only played one already. So yeah. hey, um, we, we might you know, have expect a few, good things out of him. We might have had a few people listening to that. Um, and kudos to you for mentioning that he speaks four different languages. That was unbelievable. Um, and, and what command he has over English now after not too many years. But uh, there was one little bit in there that uh, I had to add something to the video for people who might not have understood. And that's the Perim feat he talked about, Woody. What was that? Oh, yeah. You know, in our bad, we should have actually introduced that because people are now probably going, what the hell are Perim feet? Yeah. And basically... It's perimeter feet. It's short for perimeter feet. And all that is, is his stance, his footwork, when the play is on the perimeter in the zone. And so essentially what he means is a narrowed stance. Um, When they had that video review session in the morning, they looked over some old footage of Elvis. And he was really early in his, his Swiss League days, got locked in low and wide, sometimes prematurely. And as we've talked about before, this is a trend in the National Hockey League. I think it's a trend or it's a trend for good coaches. The need to sort of narrow up those feet and not be in sort of save mode as soon as that plays over center ice, locked in low and wide to sort of have the ability to transition out of a narrow upright stance when the play is on the perimeter. Because you have more power, as Elvis said, you've got extension in your legs, um, the ability to move with more power, more precision. And not to get exhausted, as he talked about as well. If you're locked in low and wide, not only is it harder to move in terms of you're slower and there's delays in your movement, not only do you make yourself smaller in the net and make your sight lines harder to find, but you're so sort of, as he said, you're kind of, you're wound up like a spring, you're ready to go, you're in that got to go get it, save execution mode when there's no need to be in. That can just drain you during the course of a game. And all those things I thought he expressed really well but are bad for not sort of introducing you to the term he expressed them around, and that was perim feet, which for him is a narrow stance. Did it not sound like there was a come on, man moment when he was talking about uh, practicing in Lugano where the extra shot, er, sorry, extra pass all the time when they, they overpass in Europe, and he was comparing it to the National League and where they shoot from everywhere, including from behind the net. <laughs> there, there's, there was that difference where just subtly he takes you behind the curtain uh, a little bit about the differences between big ice and small ice. Well, and probably speaks to the adjustment he had to mm. make. Like, you know, there's a re- reason that Igor Shesterkin, for all the success he had in the Continental Hockey League two years ago, spent his first half of this season in the American League with the New York Rangers before getting called up. And that's what made Elvis jumping straight into the Columbus, into the NHL with Columbus. You know, that's a big leap to go from a totally different style of hockey without any adjustment period. And all of a sudden in the best league in the world with the best shooters in the world and the whole world watching, you've got to make that adjustment on the fly. No American hockey league for half a season to get used to all those different things. And like you said, Darren, clearly it is a big difference. Dimensions, styles, direct attacks, the amount of shots. And this guy had to figure it out all on the fly in the national hockey league. And I don't know that enough people recognize how difficult that can be and one of the best post-game celebrations 
uh, in the game by a goaltender with the big uh, leap with his captain Felino. That's uh, that's one that uh, that we keep on watching and and enjoy every time. Uh, thanks to Cam over at the Hockey Shop, the Hockey Shop source for sports, sorry, thehockeyshop.com. And uh, thanks to Elvis, one of the world's uh, most famous names, and he's played stages all over the place, and he steps onto the stage on our nice little podcast, uh, In Goal Radio, the podcast. I'm Darren Millard. On behalf of Kevin Woodley and David Hutchison, thanks for listening. We'll chat with you again next week for Episode 95.